Hello Maker, welcome to my lab. Come on in and let's design and build a custom FPGA board from the ground up. FPGAs, they're great when you want reconfigurable logic, when you need fast, highly parallel processing, if you want to model an ASIC, in a bunch of circumstances. Now, it's good to start with eval boards and there are a ton of smaller modules available too. The FOMU is a classic, but it's so small it won't interface with anything except USB. The tiny FPGA is a great little board that can be embedded in larger projects and look, there are many, many more. More. But sometimes you have a reason to go beyond gluing modular building blocks and need something custom, a PCB of your own design that's built around or with an FPGA, and here we'll construct one from scratch and then give it some usability. Because yeah, this means circuits and PCBs, so I'll cover all the bits you need to get a bare FPGA chip running in a circuit, but to make it really usable, I also want to simplify updating it. FPGAs take in a bitstream that configures their logic and tells them how to do their job. Usually that config sits in some persistent memory, like serial flash, so the FPGA will always know how to behave after power up, and setting or updating the instructions means somehow getting the bitstream into the flash. Now the obvious way to do this is to program the flash. So use some sort of programmer, connect it to the SPI pins and push it. That means software and hardware and is a big hassle really. The next step up is to provide some hardware on board to provide a serial port say and use flash ROM or whatever to go through that from your computer and talk to the flash. But wait, we already need to have the FPGA connected to the flash and we have a whole FPGA just sitting there. So let's try and go all the way and give it a bootloader that will handle USB connections and give us a standard way to updates no extra chips required. That'll make our board simpler, more elegant, and cheaper. So once the hardware is under control, we'll tackle getting it to enumerate over USB and some bootloader that allows for easy updates. Finally, great, we have our own FPGA module. Let's prove that it works by using the update mechanism to get the FPGA doing cool stuff. If that works too, we've got a full custom system ready to be used by anyone without trouble or equipment. So why is it that I need a custom FPGA board right now? This is the tiny tape out demo board I made. It is not too bad. <laughs> On top here is the tiny tape out chip. It's an ASIC that you can have your own custom integrated circuits on along with everyone else's projects. I've talked about it before, it's really cool. Now the ASIC comes on this carrier board and you can stick it in your own projects or use this demo board which has outputs tied to the pin headers here and the seven segment display. The inputs are also on the pin header here, uh, but you can just twiddle the bits using this dip switch and even select which project you're gonna play with uh, using this one. Now ASICs take a long time to make, like months and months, and us crazy people have been willing to do our dev and a ton of simulation and then wait all that time to finally see it working. But we want to get this into the hands of a larger audience like students. And it's a lot easier to learn with feedback and a lot more fun seeing your project interacting with the real world. So the idea here is to have a drop in replacement for the ASIC carrier board. Start off with the demo board and a simulated ASIC, work on your project, see it in action, then go through getting your beautiful design sculpted in real silicon. Mmm, ASICs. So our goals today then are to create an FPGA board that will fit here on the Tiny Tape Out 3 demo boards, do it so it can be used with the demo board or not. I wanna be able to play with these standalone too. Have it wired up so it can behave the same way as the ASICs will. Have an SDK or at least some config that gives you an easy way to interact with the inputs and outputs. And finally, have a bootloader that makes it dumb easy to iterate your dev by letting you do updates through USB. If that all works out, we'll get these into some student hands and then later I'll probably be making a version for the even more capable Tiny Tape Out 4 demo boards. Uh, we'll see about that. Right now, let's get started on the circuit. Okay, you ready? Let's do this. This is the TT3 demo board schematic. It's open hardware and online if you want a deeper look. Uh, the important thing is that it has this symbol for the breakout and routes a bunch of signals to and from it. The carrier has this form factor and we need to keep the shape roughly the same and make sure we map the pin headers and connections to the same spot. So let's do that. Okay, I've pasted in the carrier board pin headers. The naming's not great, Caravel stuff, but I'm going to leave it as is for easy reference. I've also added the FPGA. We'll use the ICE40 UP5K in a 48 QFN. This is because the Lattice ICE 40s are supported by a bunch of open source tools. No thanks to Lattice, they were reverse engineered. Anyways, in the QFN 48, it's small enough to fit on the carrier here and uh, it has enough pins. Also, <laughs> it's available. So first thing, let's give all this IO labels. Here's a KiCad wonder, just draw one and then insert magics. Okay, now I'll just label these according to their FPGA names. All right, so now that's done, let's deal with powering the chip. It's gonna be 3v3 for all banks, and this guy's at 2.5 volts, so I've got basic decoupling and everything named. 
Okay, I've put some LDOs here. We'll always need the 1v2, but the demo board provides 3v3, and this guy has a note here in variant, and I'm saying this part will be populated if we want standalone operation. That's why there are zero R jumpers between the 3v3 power label and the pin header. You always need the 3v3 somehow, and the 1v2. The PLL supply goes through this 100R with some bulk and decoupling caps, and that connects right there to VCC PLL. Whereas this uh, 2v5 power is just diode drop from 3v3. I'm told by some more experienced FPGA folks that this diode thing is actually optional and you could just plug in 3v3 in there. Mm, that's fine, you could save a diode, uh, but it's labeled 2v5 and I didn't look it up, so I'm doing it the more standardy way. In any case, that drop isn't going to be huge at the currents we'll probably be pulling. There's a not reset here. I'm going to hold it high by default with this pull-up, but I'd like to optionally tie this to the external not reset from the demo board that we usually shoot off to Caravel on the ASIC. Okay, USB. I've got a USB Type-C connector here with standard 5.1K pull-downs on the CC lines. I'll just use the legacy differential USB D plus D minus. Now, debate still rages regarding the shield. I'm of the opinion that it's the host job to ground the shield, but that we can pass transients through a cap. Point is, I put uh, parallel RC footprints here and DNP them, so we have a choice. DNP, pass transients, or use 0R and ground it. Chef's choice. Okay, so what will we do with these USB lines? The SOP here is to pass the signals in through serial resistors and have a 1.5K pull up on the D minus line for USB magics. So where do we put them? Not sure how much this matters. This is an FPGA, but there are differential pairs to find. Might be nice to have the differential signals stay close together on the board. I'm going to stick them here as a group, the same way Upduino does it, just to be safe. And hey, it would be nice to use the same bootloader. Some clocking, uh, just a CMOS oscillator. I'm using 20 megahertz here, which isn't a nice fraction of USB 48 megahertz. Uh, that would be great, but I'm staying compatible with the demo board, which uses 20. Uh, use 12 or 24 or something like that if you want an easy time with USB on your own boards. So this needs to go to the FPGA. The question is where? Notice how the pin names have a bunch of info embedded within. What we care about here is the G for global. We want one of these as they're rooted special so they can drive many cells. So reserve uh, these for important things that go lots of places like clocks and resets and stuff like that. I'm going to pipe it to 25BG3 here. The demo boards also have a clock they provide to the carrier. So I'm going to connect that here and we can have a choice of standalone or demo board dependent. The FPGA has pins specified for access to memory and it's a typical W25Q32 serial spy flash. I've got them mapped here through the optional jumpers to the Caravel flash uh, on the demo board as well. Then there's this recurring pattern of jumpers where you populate two if you want to use flash or the other two uh, for CRAM, so CRAM, configuration RAM. In that case, the FPGA would need to be configured on every power up. So here I'll populate R7 and R8, in which case a MISO goes to SI, which goes to the FPGA, and similar for MOSI. The carrier pins that are the input byte are all mapped together in this bank. And I'm going to grab MPROJ IO32, IO37, which are the output bits, and stick them all in this bank. Back to inputs. These are all in order, but with TT3, the project clock is usually in, in zero. So IO21 here, and I'm going to put this on a GB pin so it can act as a clock to lots of LUTs. Now the order here doesn't really matter and I'll likely move these around to make uh, routing easier. Hey, if you're still watching and you think I should make more of this type of content, let me know with a likey or something. Now let's do some layout. This is the carrier outline imported from the original carrier board. Let's bring in the footprints. Okay, now the important thing is these guys. Going to make sure I've got them in the right spot and orientation and then group and lock them. So I've played with the in-out pin mapping a bit and spent some time doing some labeling, floor planning and placement, and it looks like uh, I could fit everything nicely. Yeah, okay, this guy and this guy. And now look at that, pretty good. The pin header mapping sucks, but thanks to the flexibility of where exactly I send things, routing wasn't too bad. Now this is a two layer dev board and EMC doesn't matter much, but I'm going to add some stitching to tighten up SI a bit and tie that FPGA ground to something with those as well. I want to set the pad so it's tied to the ground net and that ref star star name is awful. So I'll just call it stitch one. Now I'll peruse the board and add some around and in important places. Okay, well this PCB is looking pretty swell. Yeah, that's cool.
So I'll need to get some parts in Gerber's now. Uh, let's take a peek at the bomb. Boy, do I love this plugin. Okay, nice. So I'm going to send these off to the fab and turn my dreams into reality. Assuming they work, the next step will be all about using the custom FPGA boards. I want that bootloader that'll let us easily update the thing and some sort of SDK or whatever to mask away the details of the mess I've made with the routing. I'll have an update on all this very soon. Keep an eye out or subscribe if you want to be notified when it comes out. Thanks for watching. See you soon. Cheers.